COVID-19 reached British Columbia earlier in this pandemic. Back in January, about a month later, it reported the country's first coronavirus death. Now, it's the latest province to announce how it will begin easing restrictions. Currently in phase one and on partial lockdown, BC will move to phase two gradually over the next few weeks. Small gatherings of up to six people will be allowed and elective surgeries will resume. Health services as well, like dentists. Businesses like hair salons, retail stores, restaurants and pubs can soon reopen. But will British Columbians feel safe moving at that speed? Adrian Dix is BC's Minister of Health. I spoke with him earlier today. Hi, Minister Dix. Good to see you again. Good to see, good to see you at a distance. <laughs> at a very Yes, at a distance. Uh, Minister, we carried uh, the press conference with yourself, Dr. Henry, and uh, the Premier yesterday live on our program, the announcement about loosening restrictions or the sort of plan to do so in the future. You have said and you did say that British Columbians need to be 100 percent all in on the plan to safely sort of head into the summer. What exactly will that look like? So are we talking physical distancing on the streets, in stores, in workplaces? What can you tell us about what British Columbians watching can expect to that effect? Well, in BC, uh, during this period of pandemic, we issued fewer orders and British Columbians really followed them. And so we want to continue with that strategy of empowering people. And they've been incredibly responsive. We're incredibly grateful to people in BC. So physical distancing in workplaces, in places where we play and in places where we meet each other, families and friends, that's got to be our friend, the, the tool that we utilize to ensure that we don't relaunch transmission of COVID-19 in BC. In addition to that, we need to use, we see plexiglass everywhere now, I think more so than I've ever seen in my life. And we're going to see more of that in more uh, retail locations, for example, and all more workplaces to keep us safe because those kind of engineering initiatives really work. And then, of course, the key, and the key for all of us, is to ensure that if we're sick, stay home, not go to school, not go to work, not visit family, especially. And these are the kind of provisions we're going to have to do in the new normal. This isn't going back to December. These are, um, but we're going to work with the people of BC, with the business community, with workers, to make sure that we stay safe in this period where there's no vaccine and there's no cure for COVID-19. I hear you every night talk about uh, various shipments of personal protective equipment. And, and to my mind, it sounds like you're, you're focused as all sort of provincial politicians are right now on being able to secure that personal protective equipment. How much more of it do you anticipate you'll need as those restrictions on the economy loosen? And will you expect, for example, hair salons to be outfitted with it or the people who work in them rather? Well, I want to distinguish between medical uh, PPE, which is required for the healthcare system. So, for example, uh, we've uh, we've purchased 3.5 and have with us 3.5 million N95 masks. They're from new sources, which means they require testing. So, there's all of that work in the healthcare system. And then, one of the tools we can use where physical distancing isn't possible is the use of non-medical masks mm -hmm. that people can use to keep their droplets in and not spread. Uh, COVID-19. And so that will be uh, utilized in a number of sectors. We've talked about one of the places in combination with shields and so on, we can use it, for example, is in the personal services uh, industry in barber shops and hair salons and so on to ensure people stay safe. And so we're working through industry by industry in a methodical way, what techniques we can put in place from physical distancing to, to engineering changes to PPE can be put in place to keep people safe. And we're going to have to do this for some time. This new normal is going to last longer than even the period we've been in has lasted. And so we've got to work together to see that that happens. You announced the big announcement today from you was around the return of elective surgeries. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it, it is the province that your province canceled rather 30,000 surgeries in order to increase hospital capacity for COVID-19 patients. Do you have any kind of timeline or estimate of a timeline for how it, long it will take to get through that backlog? Overall, it's going to take, I'd say, 17 to 24 months, because remember, it's 30,000 surgeries that have been postponed. In addition to that, there's been less testing and screening, which is very important for many people. Fit testing for people with the, the fit exam for people with uh, who are, have concerns with colorectal cancer, mammographies, and so on. So there's going to be demand there. We have done less referrals for surgery as well. So it's going to take us a long time and a massive effort. And our commitment to people is the same level of effort we put to deal with COVID-19. We have to put into this. 
when we made the decision to cancel elective surgeries, and you've been covering this every day, so you know this, the images were of hospitals such as those in Italy that were overrun, and we simply couldn't allow that to happen. We continue to do urgent surgeries in this period, about 17,000 of them, so emergency surgeries and urgent surgeries, but a lot of people have been left suffering in pain, and we've got to get on with that task now. At the start of this uh, epidemic, I remember uh, watching your press conferences and there was a lot of concern in uh, long-term care homes in BC. I know that the province took uh, a, a certain number of actions, for example, like limiting the number of homes that someone could work in very early on in. In other provinces, we've seen uh, it unfold kind of horrifically, to be honest, where we see so many of the deaths that, that have taken place due to COVID-19 occur in those homes. Today, the, the federal government announced an agreement in principle with provinces to top up the wages of essential workers. Can you provide any details about how what that agreement means specifically for B.C.? Well, uh, that's something that the finance ministers are working on, and we're obviously enthusiastic to hear about that because I think... Uh, how people feel about their frontline workers here in BC is expressed every day at seven o'clock. But I think what's important is also the issue of fundamental change. In uh, in BC, we made some changes, legal changes around long-term care that protected workers a year ago. We've been moving to hire more people in long-term care to raise care standards for a year. But there's still many people who are working at multiple sites. So we instituted some very tough measures that are continuing to be in place. And this is very hard. We're going, we're heading towards Mother's Day. And we know how many people are in long-term care right now who haven't been visited by members of those their families. And those restrictions are going to continue for some time. And it is the hardest thing. It's affected my family personally and many others. One of the hardest things we've done because, of course, uh, in those moments, especially in long-term care in hospital, having our family around us is important. So those measures for long-term care to keep, it, keep people safe will continue to be in place. And the structural changes we need to make to value the work done by workers in long-term care, in many cases to raise their salaries and to ensure uh, that they're operating at one site and one site only are critical changes we need to make because this isn't over. We know this. We have to continue to prepare for f future spikes and nobody is more vulnerable than people living residents of long-term care homes. Do you think when it comes to the salary of the essential workers who work in those homes, that, that ha when you say structural, do you mean that it should be, should be permanent, the increase to that salary? Well, right now we have a public health order uh, for single site and long-term care. And one of the ways that we've made that real, because then you're asking people who work in multiple sites to choose. You're using the emergency, our emergency powers to do that. And you're forcing people to choose between sites. You have to make sure they don't lose out in that or a site that doesn't pay as much would end up having no workers or few workers. So we have uh, we have done some we've done leveling up of wages to a basic level. That's the plan in BC during this period, in order to ensure that um, long-term care workers we can implement single site in a way that's not unfair to the very people who are providing the care. What the, we're doing in terms of the federal government, what they're proposing today is um, uh, supports for essential workers in this period, and obviously we're working with them on that. That That is, I'd say, um, uh, more temporary. I suspect the changes that we've made in long-term care, the public health orders that have gone forward in long-term care are going to be quite long-lasting here. And just finally, before I let you go, on the subject of long-term care, because there is this sort of obviously acute issue that everyone is dealing with, but it has sparked, as you mentioned, a, a much broader conversation about the structural deficiencies that underpin a lot of what we've seen. And, and to be fair, not as much in BC, but in other provinces. There is even a, a proposal being put forth for long-term cares to move under the Canada Health Act or to uh, be more, I guess, in the jurisdiction of the federal government. What is your initial, what are your initial thoughts on that? Well, first of all, and we're obviously working with the federal government on lots of things. There are proposals, as you know, for national pharmacare. I've heard proposals for national dental care. I've heard proposals for national long-term care. And if it means providing more resources for people in our health care uh, facilities, uh, you bet I'd be interested in any of those discussions. But we're not waiting for that. We can't wait for that. In the meantime, we have to take uh, all of the actions that we're taking. And I think that's important. With respect to the federal government, what's really important for them, you know this in B.C., our largest outbreak is not in a long-term care home in B.C., but in, in the federal uh, institution at Mission, uh, correctional institution at Mission. And so what we also need to focus on, all of us right now, is making sure that we do the best job within our jurisdiction and work closely together. And that's what we're trying to do with the federal government. 
Okay, I'll leave it there, Minister. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Anytime, Bash. That's Health Minister Adrian Dix. We have developed a framework to restart scheduled surgeries and procedures safely, starting with the most urgent surgeries like cancer and cardiac procedures. We're telling the hospitals to get ready. We're telling patients to get ready. And we're hopeful many of these scheduled surgeries can start soon. Premier Doug Ford there unveiled his government's plans to resume scheduled surgeries that were postponed because of COVID-19. The province has outlined criteria that hospitals have to meet before they can resume those surgeries, like a stable supply of personal protective equipment and medications, adequate bed capacity, and a low number of COVID-19 cases. How many hospitals, though, might be able to meet those conditions? Could people be waiting weeks or months more for their elective surgeries? Dr. Fayez Qureshi is the interim vice president at Toronto General Hospital and now leading a clinical activity working group across the University Health Network, tasked with figuring out how hospitals can ramp up scheduled sur surgeries. Rather, Again, he joins us from Toronto. Hi, doctor. Great to see you. Thank you for making time for us. Oh, thanks, Fashi, for having me this evening. I want to be clear that the province did lay out criteria, but not a specific timeline for the resumption of those surgeries. Uh, before we get into what that might look like going ahead, if you could reflect for us on, on what it looked like over the past month, month and a half, you were um, part of, you know, you, involved in determining whose surgery gets delayed and, and for what reason and that kind of thing. What was that experience like? You know, Vashi, it's been absolutely an unprecedented time, and I will say that the decisions to delay and defer surgery were made with really a heavy heart. And really what we were trying to do is balance public health concern with individual patient needs, and it was challenging. You know, I personally, as a surgical oncologist, have patients waiting at home for their urgent surgery, and to, to call them and to inform them that there'll be a delay was a challenging task. But I can tell you that all of our patients, remarkably, were willing to sacrifice their time in the hospital for those in the community that may need it even more. Wow. Were you, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but were you surprised at the reaction? I, I can only imagine putting myself in their shoes and how devastated I would be. Uh, were you surprised by that? You know, I have to tell you that um, the human spirit and resilience is remarkable. And we often talk about heroes being healthcare workers and frontline providers of care, but heroes are also our patients when they're so willing to sacrifice for, for, you know, for fellow Ontarians and other citizens. What about for yourself? I mean, a doctor's uh, instinct from, from all my, you know, the friends that I have, the family that I have is to treat people, right, to help them get better. How uh, difficult was it for you to make those calls? Uh, it was very challenging. You know, in fact, it keeps me up at night even today as I think Think about my patients that are waiting for care, but I think it's about balancing kind of the needs of our current patients and our future patients as we try to schedule surgery in a very safe and systematic manner. And so when we look back six or seven weeks ago <clears throat> with some of the jurisdictions in other geographies where really it was catastrophic what we were seeing in images, it became clear to us that we had to prepare for the we had to prepare our capacity for the potential patients that would come into hospital. And let me ask you, from your perspective, did it work? Did, did freeing up that capacity, uh, did it work? You know, I, I think it did. You know, we at UHN are a national, provincial, and regional asset. Patients from across the country and province come to our hospital for very, very specialized care for respiratory illness. And creating that capacity allowed us to care for those patients. And so... You know, we were very careful in thinking this through. We used very strict definitions that if a patient required care within 14 days or there would be irreparable harm, we delivered that care. So it's often a misnomer, Vashi, that people think that surgery hasn't been going on all along. In fact, it has been just for the most urgent. Where it was safely, where we were safely able to defer and delay, we've done so. And, and when it comes to deferring and delaying and the resumption of those surgeries, that, that's what the province announced today, basically a criteria for hospitals to be able to do that. What is your sense of that criteria and, and various hospitals' ability to meet it? So, you know, I'll tell you that the, the criteria that the province has laid out is actually quite consistent with what we've been thinking about here at UHN as well for the past several weeks. Um, and I think it's a safe and systematic approach for our current and future patients. It considers things like our PPE supply and the supply chain stability, what the epidemiology or the numbers in the region look like. It takes into account what's happening in long-term care. 
Where are our staff being deployed? Where are they being used? All those factors take into account are taken into account, and I think they're important because opening the doors for surgery doesn't simply mean turning a light switch on. It means being able to have all those resources necessary to deliver safe care while still balancing the potential patients that may come through the door. I think we've been fortunate so far with the, the pandemic, but I think many of us recognize that there may be other shockwaves down the line, and we just have to be prepared when that happens. I know it's going to depend on, on the hospital that you're in, but uh, based on what you heard today, what kind of timeline do you envision for the resumption of those surgeries? Or is it possible to know that timeline right now? You know, I think, I think it's difficult. I think one thing that we're committed to is to being a, a regional player and a partner with other hospitals and the province and certainly being in lockstep with um, the entire region as we move forward. I'm hoping and optimistic for my own personal patients and as a healthcare administrator that it'll be soon. Um, I can tell you in the background we are preparing uh, and when the opportunity comes up we'll be ready to go at 100%. And what's the process at that point, should it arrive, of deciding which sur surgeries are up first? Like, how is that determined? So we've uh, put together an interdisciplinary team, and it's this clinical activity group that you were talking about. Really, it, it's a diverse group of people that represents the, the dynamic programs in our hospital. And there are nurses, doctors, um, uh, a clinical uh, ethicist, as well as patient partners that make up that team. And together, we're listing out criteria on how we triage patients based on urgency. So, you know, we've used the definition of within 14 days, but what does that really look like? What we've asked teams to do is to, to call their patients, assess for their risks, and then list them out in a particular triage system so that we can prioritize the most urgent first. I'm glad you mentioned physicians calling their patients because I'm wondering for people who are watching right now and anxious to know, you know, I had a scheduled surgery, I don't know when it's going to happen, what, uh, what you would tell them, basically sit tight until you hear from somebody? Uh, you know what, I would say first and foremost, thank you for being patient and thank you for, for your resilience because I know this is hard and it's difficult. Um, I would say that we're committed to you and we're committed to the delivery of care for you as soon as it's possible and safe to do so. That we recognize there are a group of patients out in the community that have other illnesses like COVID that need the resources right now. But that if things change, if symptoms escalate and you're unwell, please come to hospital or call your health care provider. We want to care for you now. As far as the scope of all of this is concerned, I spoke to the health minister in BC a few hours ago and he, they had just announced the resumption of those surgeries there. And he said it would take between 17 and 24 months, that's their estimate, to get through sort of the, the quote unquote backlog. Uh, do you think there's a similar kind of timeline in, in Ontario? You know, it's, it's hard to be exactly certain how long it'll take. I can tell you one thing that's been remarkable in this period of time is that there have been novel models of care that have come forward that have really changed and revolutionized the way we care. And one example is virtual care and being able to connect with our patients, um, even though we're not able to see them face to face. In terms of surgery we're, and procedures, you know, we're asking the questions, can we do things differently? Can patients be done as an outpatient as opposed to requiring inpatient services? Can we use different forms of anesthesia, like regional anesthetics or local anesthetics, to decrease the amount of patients that need to come into hospital. So, uh, you know, I, there are a number of patients that are waiting um, in queue. Uh, I do think it'll take several weeks, maybe months, to, to get through that uh, number of patients. But I'm hoping that n new, th new ways of delivering care and models can also be used to help uh, expedite that. Okay, I have to leave it there, Dr. Kreshi, but I really appreciate your time and your insights tonight. And thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing throughout all of this. Thank you, Vashi, for the opportunity. Dr. Fayez Kreshi is the Interim Vice President at the Toronto General Hospital. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.